I'd like to thank the organizers for having me here at this meeting. It's an honor to be part of this and see the breadth of cancer efforts that are taking place here and how they're going to be integrated. I'm going to tell you about what I'm hoping can lead to finding some of the pieces of the puzzle and studying the complex set of diseases that we cause cancer, how we, can, how we could use a genomics approach. And I'd like to tell you before I get into my presentation today that I am sharing this through TAMIST, okay? So a lot of these slides will have URLs to different resources on them, and in addition, they'll have references on them, and I wouldn't want you to waste your time trying to copy that information down. Also, if you find the slides useful for something like teaching, please feel free to go ahead and use them for you know, whatever purpose. If this doesn't work out, send me an email. I'll find a way to get you the slides. So I'd like to start off by telling you a little bit about what ENCODE is and what's the rationale for it. But then I'll spend most of the time on the second bullet here. How is ENCODE being used today to study the role of genotype variation in human disease? And then I'll finish up by telling you a little bit about the kinds of resources that ENCODE has and where we're sharing. So first I'd like to tell you about something that became obvious as the Human Genome Project was going on, as other sequencing projects were going on as well. That is, reading genomes is very difficult. And part of the reason for this in the human genome is we know from applying the genetic code to it that only a small portion, about 1% of the human genome, codes for protein, as you can see in the schematics in the bottom of the slide. So this means that if you want to learn about the non-coding portion of the genome and what it's doing, you have a difficult problem before you because there isn't any regulatory code that you can apply to the genome to find out what parts of the genome are doing something. Now, we do have sequence comparison, and this is a very important and useful tool. But even when this works, it doesn't tell us what the parts of the genome are doing in what cell type or under what particular conditions. Moreover, regulatory regions don't have to be contiguous with the genes they work with. So simply finding regulatory regions doesn't tell you what genes they work with. So NHGRI is one of the follow-on projects for the Human Genome Project has undertaken the ENCODE project. So part of the reason for doing this is also that we know non-coding DNA is important. We know this in part from genomic studies, like GWAS studies, where over 90% of the findings lie outside of protein coding regions. If we want to throw away 90% of these findings, we'll really diminish our power. So we want to have a way to get at all of these findings. Studies of recent adaptation find a similar message where the vast majority of findings lie outside of protein coding regions in the genome. Or if one is a more single gene based person, one can look at anecdotes and if we look at, for instance, Fragile X, a severe Mendelian disorder, this is caused by non-coding mutations in the genome. ALS, there is a recent stir of identification of non-coding mutations that are important for it. Initially they were tagged as protein coding variants, and later people realized that this assignment was incorrect. There are also variants linked to thyroid cancer, prostate cancer, among others. So here is an illustration of what the problem looks like that we confront every day if you do use genetic and genomic data. And that is, if you stare at a block of sequence, and this is mercifully only one two millionth of the human genome, there's very little that you can see other than you can usually recognize this DNA sequence. And if you have some unusual cognitive gift, maybe you could see further into this. But this is a solved problem for us. We work with this every day because we use maps and annotation to add to the sequence, and that brings our understanding. So what I've done here is now colored in blue the coding, protein coding sequence, and colored in red the region of the genome where a variant can cause allergy and asthma, or is linked to allergy and asthma, where you can see the schematic below that adds to this understanding. Now if we had richer maps, we could learn even more from the genomic sequence. So here again is the same uh, scheme that you saw on the bottom. But now what we can do is we can add in ENCODE data shown in the rows or tracks at the bottom. And what this allows us to do, and you'll see how this works during this presentation, is to identify in that red box what looks to be a regulatory region that this variant either lies within or near. Also of import is that this regulatory region is especially prominent in a particular cell type. In fact, a particular cell type that's known to be important in allergy and asthma. Another piece of information we get is, while this variant lies within one physical gene, a DNA repair gene, you can predict from ENCODE that it looks like this uh, regulatory region 
actually regulates the neighboring cytokine genes. And these genes are known to play an important role in allergy or asthma. So richer maps can help us to understand more from the genome, and hopefully that can be one part of the solving the cancer puzzle. So the goals of ENCODE are to catalog all of the functional elements in the genome. This is an aspirational goal. I don't think it's technically achievable, and there'd be no way to know when, in fact, it were achieved if it were done. We're also freely sharing this as a resource. By freely sharing, I mean if you have internet access, you have access to ENCODE. And I'm going to tell you about human studies today, but 20% of the ENCODE data is mouse data, also very useful. And the Mod ENCODE project, sibling project to ENCODE, studied fly and worm. ENCODE is collecting data, analyzing data, and hosting data. This is all in one project. So ENCODE is built on decades of research on gene regulation. It's a very strong and very important foundation. For years, people studying the mechanism of gene regulation have looked at things on the top part of this cartoon, such as DNA-DNA interactions, changes in chromatin structure, and binding of proteins to DNA to learn about the mechanism of gene regulation. And ENCODE is using high-throughput genome-wide versions of these assays to reverse engineer the genome, saying we know that these are hallmarks of gene regulation. How can we use these two in the schematic on the bottom, identify where genes are, the transcripts that come from the genes, and regulatory regions like promoters, enhancers, splicing sites, right? And we're doing this by collecting information about RNA. This example shows the INC4A, 4B tumor suppressor locus, which harbors a well-known non-coding RNA. And we're, we're measuring the amounts of RNA, the cell specificity of RNA production, and through the GenCode project, which has been part of ENCODE since its inception, we're trying to assemble the RNA data into transcripts. We're also measuring a lot about chromatin structure, especially DNA successibility and uh, histone modifications through chromatin immunoprecipitation. This tells us where candidate regulatory regions are. It also tells us about what cell types those regions appear to be active in. So this is very useful information. And ENCODE for years has been collecting uh, information on DNA binding proteins. More recently, we've expanded the effort in looking at RNA binding proteins. DNA binding proteins, again, tell us about transcriptional regulation to a first approximation, whereas RNA binding proteins can tell us about post-transcriptional regulation, changes in splicing, message stability, translational efficiency, for example. So in summary, ENCODE has collected these, this data and produced a freely shared catalog telling us about genomic elements in the genome. ENCODE is built upon a, a very safe foundation, and we're grateful to have years of study of gene regulation in order to work from. And ENCODE maps, I'd like to tell you about in the next part, can be used to increase our understanding of genomic findings and also mechanistic findings of how parts of the genome work. So now I'd like to turn to how you can use genetic variation to understand phenotype by adding in ENCODE data. And I'd like to start off with perhaps an odd slide, publications on ENCODE data. The blue bars here are publications that are funded by the consortium. Sorry, the purple bars. But what I'd like to emphasize are the blue bars, which are labeled community publications. These are publications that have used ENCODE data without ENCODE funding. This is a good thing. <laughs> this is what the project is for. And this is evidence that the project's being widely used in research today. This is not a hypothetical. Over 600 publications, for example, have used human or mouse ENCODE data in their research. A large number of these are studying human disease, and it's probably no surprise to the people in this room that the most commonly studied disease using ENCODE data is cancer. So ENCODE data is used in a number of ways, and with respect to disease, I think it's most important to understand the best application is for hypothesis generation or hypothesis refinement. This can lead to ideas which you can um, test in further experimentation. In particular, it can help you get from a statistical association of a variant to the actual causal variant. It can help you get from an associated variant to the target gene for that variant. It can help you to understand what cell type that variant works in. And I won't say much about this, but it can also help you learn how that variant may work. And I'm not going to directly address the two topics on the bottom, but I want to point out that I'm going to use genetics as an example here. 
But if you have epigenetic data and you're familiar with using it, many of the same principles would apply for using ENCODE with epigenetic data with the standard caveats. The same thing, I'm going to use germline variation as an example here, but ENCODE data are very useful for somatic variation as well. Again, analysis of somatic variants has some, uh, some differences from germline variants. As long as you're aware of that, ENCODE is quite useful for that as well. So first use case is how would one get from a statistical association to understanding what the causal variant might be. And in, it's a, a truism in the field that the two don't have to be the same, the associated variant and the causal variant, for at least three fundamental reasons. First of all, statistical tests may not discriminate among a number of variants. Second of all, statistical test is applied to the variants that were in the experiment. The causal variant might not have been in the experiment, therefore it's not assigned a score. And second of all, often the field works under the premise that we are finding the causal variant. But there is some evidence that sometimes there are multiple causal variants in a, in a region, and one doesn't know how many one is looking for. Um, and I'd like to point out that the paper at the bottom from Mike Snyder's lab uh, has a nice review of some of the ways that you can use ENCODE to predict what functional variants might be from, cause, from associated variants. The reason that I think ENCODE ends up being useful for this is if we look at something like GWAS findings, many of those findings lie within ENCODE and, and roadmap epigenomics project annotations. In this example, using DNA accessibility, about half of the GWAS findings lie in candidate regulatory elements, or if you're willing to expand that to include linkage disequilibrium, about three quarters. So there's reason to think there could be predictive power, and how does one actually use this? So first I'll tell you about a couple of um, semi-automated tools. First, this is Haploreg from Manolis Kellis' lab at MIT. And by the arrow one, you can put in the name of a um, SNP ID or a genetic coordinate and then click Submit. And then Haploreg finds for you and code annotations of that region. You can see from the arrow at left the uh, information about the SNP that was put in, a colorectal um, risk variant. And you can also see other SNPs that were in LD and what findings there are about them. Uh, another t uh, tool that I think is very useful, provides somewhat complementary information. I recommend using both. RegulomeDB from Mike Cherry and Mike uh, Snyder's groups at Stanford. Again, you can put in a genomic coordinate or SNP ID or a variant file and hit enter. RegulomeDB by arrow number three initially gives you a score, the likelihood that this is a regulatory variant Lower numbers here are higher probability, higher numbers, lower probability. You can also click through that and see what is the evidence underlying this, or you can click through and see browser view of what this region looks like. RegulomeDB also has, this regu has a GWAS database for approximately 500 different phenotypes and, and diseases. Uh, the project has collected uh, the SNPs that are known to be associated with that, you can click on a particular disorder and find the list of known variants or suspected variants. And you can find the information that RegulomeDB has on those, what the GWAS study is that found this variant and what the um, ENCODE type information is supporting a regulatory role for this variant. Uh, also very useful if one is familiar with looking at epigenomic and transcriptomic data is to actually visualize the tracks in the region of interest. Here adjacent to the MYC gene, uh, the gene desert lying next to it, that's known to harbor some regulatory elements. You can see the red arrow at the bottom pointing to some uh, genetic variants that are linked to a variety of cancers. And you can see supporting and code evidence that suggests it's likely that this variant lies in or near a regulatory region. So now I'd like to move on to the topic of predicting target genes. This may be, sound like it's counterintuitive, one thinks you find the variant, you know the gene, but what ENCODE has found in other projects as well is very often a regulatory region can work several genes away. So regulatory regions can work at least at megabase distance from uh, their target genes, including for a Mendelian disorder. Regulatory regions can work on multiple genes, so there's not always the target gene. The cartoon at the bottom shows on the left that a typical gene can be regulated by multiple elements, or that a typical regulatory element can regulate a handful of genes. It's also important to remember that the target gene could be a non-coding RNA. One needs to consider that in the search. So 
predictions from ENCODE suggest that most GWAS findings are at least 100 KB away from the target gene, again, suggesting that likely they're regulating one or two or three genes away from the nearest gene. This has practical implications you can see in this example. At the left, you can see a, a SNP that's been highlighted that has a platelet count phenotype, okay? And what one might do without other information is work from the closest genes to the furthest genes and test to see whether there's a causal relationship between the phenotype and that genetic variant. But you can also use ENCODE data to predict what's the most likely target gene for this variant. In this case, the answer is at the far right, about five genes away, and it's JAK2. Imagine how different the research program is here. One can start working on JAK2 as a hypothesis. This is a known pathway where there are already small molecules that are known to regulate this pathway. One could start working there, or one could, after several years of research, get to the most likely candidate gene. So I think this is a very important application of ENCODE. So how one would do this in, in a research program, there are at least two different ways to do this. The regulatory elements database, shown on this slide, developed by Terry Fury's lab, has a nice web user interface, and it allows you to go from genomic coordinates, shown here, to the candidate regulatory regions in that region, and then each of those are hyperlink enabled, and you can see the prediction if there is one for the target gene for that link and also a p-value for either a positive or a negative correlation. So this is one way to see what genes are, are predicted to be targets of regulatory elements. This also works in a number of different other ways with the same tool. You could, for instance, start with gene and say, what are the linked regulatory elements? Uh, less, less user-friendly, but every bit as useful, is a table that was published as supplementary material and in code publication a few years ago by John Stamatoyanopoulos' lab. And you can sort this table by either gene or by regulatory element, and then you can look through that and find the region of interest that you're studying. And that's what was used to make the prediction shown at the beginning of this. And I'll point out that I use this because this is a well-studied gene regulation system. It's known that in mouse, the region in a box, the homologous region in mouse, is a locus control region, and it regulates those neighboring genes. So ENCODE, being blind to this, doing statistical calculations, predicts the same in human. So I'd, lastly, I'd like to talk about predicting target cell types. This may seem very counterintuitive to some, but very obvious to others. If you think about, for instance, heart disease, we know heart disease expects multiple cell types, smooth muscle cells and vessels, endothelial cells, macrophages, livers, liver cells, platelets, right? So if one finds a genetic connection to heart disease, that doesn't tell you what's the cell type that that variant is working in. So there's an unmet need. And the etiology, so the defect doesn't have to be intrinsic to the cell type that has the pathology either. If one thinks about, for instance, how um, severe combined auto, uh, immunodeficiencies work, very often it's mutations in lymphocytes, the adaptive immune system that are responsible. But there's at least one example where a mutation in a seemingly unrelated cell type, epithelial cells, is important. And the reason for this makes biological sense. The epithelial cells are the niche that developing lymphocytes form in. But one might start saying, oh, immune phenotype has to be in immune cells. Could be flat out wrong. And lastly, we don't always know the etiology of diseases. I'm old enough to remember a time when we, we all knew that type 1 diabetes was a digestive disorder, and that's how we looked at it. Now everybody knows type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disorder, but I'm sure we're all working on diseases today where there will be surprising findings as to what cell types are involved. So if one wanted to make predictions about what cell types might be important for genetic variants from ENCODE, one way to do this is through regulatory elements database. And you can see the red arrow at the top pointing to one line in a bar graph. That shows the intensity of the regulatory element signal by cell type. And you see essentially just one bar graph because this element is very cell specific. So it's useful as an example. And one can predict that this cell type or a cell type like it is where variants in this regulatory region might be important. One can also go back to haploreg and regulome DB. And if you mouse over results in haploreg, as shown on the left, cell type information pops up. Or if you look in regular OMDB information, there's a column on cell type that the findings come from. So that can give you information on what cell types might be responsible for 
pathology that you see. Perhaps a more principled way to do this is to compute on the data. What's done in this example here from John Stamatoyanopoulos' lab is to take lists of encode elements, in this case, DNAs1 hypersensitive sites, and compare it and take those lists by cell type, and then ask for a GWAS finding of interest. In this case, this is Crohn's disease. What's the enrichment by cell type? And this is an interesting example because Crohn's disease, I think you'll all be familiar with, has digestive symptoms, yet the etiology is autoimmunity, right? So where do those variants, those genetic variants, work? And what ENCODE suggests here, you can see in the graph on the right, at the top, TH17 cells are the most enriched. And this fits with what was previously known for this disorder, TH17 cells infiltrate in the gut, and mouse play an important role in this disorder. So this is, suggests that you can predict the important cell type for using ENCODE. I'd like to add, people ask me all the time, what of the cell type I'm interested in is not in ENCODE? We have a few hundred cell types, but depending on how you slice and dice things, that means for sure your cell type is not in ENCODE, right? But if you look at this finding here, um, the immune cells are in red, intestinal cells are in purple, other cells are in gray. And even if you cover up TH17 cells, or their closely related uh, fate TH1, you can see that immune cells are still the most enriched, more enriched than gut. So if one came at this with the hypothesis of, I know there are two basic types of cell types that are involved in this, one could still tell which the variants were working in, even if that cell type weren't in ENCODE. Finally, I'd like to tell you a little bit of how you can use ENCODE to identify additional genetic variants that could be important for a disorder. In this example, also from Stamatoyanopoulos lab, a heart electrical phenotype was compared against ENCODE and roadmap epigenomics data. And what we can see is it's enriched in heart tissue. What you can see if you look from right to left at this is as you relax the p-value, you find more genetic variants, but there's still enrichment in heart. And you can't see the numbers here, but at the right, there are only 20 variants. But as you move to the left, you can increase to 200 or so variants. So if one has the throughput of testing more variants, here's a principled way, perhaps, to expand the number of hypotheses one could test. So in summary, the major use case for ENCODE disease, in disease, I would argue, is hypothesis generation and refinement, prediction of causal variants, prediction of target genes, prediction of pathogenic cell types. I think it's also useful in, in making inferences about the mechanism of disease and in, in, uh, action. So finally, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what the ENCODE resources are and also how you can access them. My goal here is not to go through everything, rather to map out the space so you might see what might be of interest to you. Um, the most important location to find these things is at the ENCODE portal, encodeproject.org. That's one URL I do want you to remember codeproject.org. All right, and if you go to the portal, you can mouse over and, um, from methods and find the data standards, for example. And we share our data standards for two fundamentally different reasons. First of all, we want what we do to be transparent so people can decide, do they trust the evidence base or not, and should they use it? Second of all, we're well aware that lots of other people are using this approach in these assays. So if people find the way that we're doing this to be useful, we want them to be able to use our methods or adapt them as they see fit. So you can access this on the ENCODE portal, our data standards. We also have software tools on the portal. We have a mix of software tools that were developed by the consortium and also tools developed by people outside the consortium that we found very useful. Again, they're very useful for this kind of work, so we've collected them in one spot as a, as a resource for the community. They're divided in topics like element calling, integrative analysis and analyzing the data. The, I think the heart and soul of ENCODE is being able to visualize and download the data. The bulk of our data is unrestricted access or open access, so you can get it in GEO. But if you go to the ENCODE portal, you can be sure you're getting the accessioned data that is most up to date. Um, you can do this through the portal, and the portal also offers metadata-driven searching. That's an ugly sounding name for something that's remarkably useful. This is how, for instance, Amazon works. You can refine the parameters that you find useful in your search. 
So for example, you might say, I want to gate on just the mouse data or just the human data, or I just want to see DNA findings and RNA seq findings, or I just want to see brain findings, and it, you have a live uh, count of what findings are left as you make the choices. So you can get to the data that are of use to you, and then you can either download it or visualize it. And I'd like to point out our data policy. Um, the top red arrow pointing to the part in bold on our website talks about this. There are no restrictions. There is no embargo. As soon as the data are public, anybody can use them in their research. That's the point of the project. We want people to use this data without any encumbrances. One thing that we ask, the second arrow down there is, if you do use the data, please cite the project. That helps you in terms of transparency and showing what you're doing. That helps us in terms of acknowledging the, the value of what we're doing. We'd also like to encourage people, if you're using the resource, to cite accession numbers for the data that you use. This will help you and your research because your work will be more transparent to other people. They can tell what you did and how you did it. So we're rolling out what we're calling an encyclopedia prototype. We're, trying to, we're always trying to say, what's a way to make the resource that we have more useful? And now we're rolled out some simplified and complex annotations from ENCODE data. So at the top of the annotations or encyclopedia page are what we think are the most important, most heavily used annotations. Elements that one can download, such as promoters and enhancers, or one can click on the visualize enhancers link, or one can also see the gene expression by cell type and gene table. But what we also have further down on this list is, I think, a tremendous depth and breadth of analyses done for different purposes, different reasons, lots of specialized analyses. But one of them may be the particular thing that you're looking for rather than the more general thing that uh, a lot of users are looking for. So we're trying to offer both, trying to make this easy for everybody. We face the problem that easy is different for everybody, but we always welcome feedback on this. We also have publications on the ENCODE portal. And we highlight these because a lot of times people will ask me, how can I use ENCODE in my research? And I've spent some time telling you about this today, but a lot of these illustrations are taken from seeing how the community is using ENCODE in their work. So again, we have on the top, by the top red arrow, ENCODE funded publications, and one can see various groups of them. And by the bottom arrow, these community publications, people outside of ENCODE that are using the data We've broken them into some categories, such as basic biology research, human disease studies, and you can see how they're being used. And again, by our count, looking at the etiology of disease, the most common application of ENCODE right now is cancer. I think that should be unsurprising for this group. There's also been a lot of using ENCODE for diseases whose etiology is either autoimmunity or inflammatory or allergic. Uh, rounding out the top group is um, neurodegeneration and psychiatric disorders, cardiovascular disease, and then also metabolic disease. So I'd also like to point out to our colleagues in IHEC, International Human Epigenome Consortium, something like the um, ICGC project is to TCGA. And CODE is part of IHEC, and we have a great working relationship with our other colleagues. The NIH Common Fund Project Roadmap Epigenomics started off the IHEC project. We're happy to be part of it. And a lot of other projects now have data coming online. For instance, the EU project Blueprint has a foot, one of their focuses, foci focuses, is on blood cancers. So I'd encourage you to check out their data as well as data from other projects. So in summary, there are a lot of different ways to get at ENCODE data. And how you might do this depends on your interest and what you're trying to find. Again, these URLs are in the slide set that that's being shared. No need to copy these things down. And I'd like to sum up by saying that the goal of ENCODE is to create this freely shared resource, which we hope adds additional annotations and maps to the genome, and that it will facilitate our understanding of genomic data. And pertinent today, I'm hoping that that will then be one piece of the part, one piece of the puzzle in solving the diseases that we call, can that we call cancer. And this freely, re freely shared resource is an important thing, part of the project. And I'd like to emphasize that this is not a hypothetical, and code data are being used today in human disease studies 
and we think they'll only be of more importance as time goes on. So on my last slide, I'd like to tell you about who's actually done this. I've had a tiny or insignificant role of this. Of this. ENCODE is a consortium of hundreds of people, and it's my privilege to every day to get to work with people that are engaged, enthusiastic, creative, and smart. I have like one of the best jobs that somebody could have. I'd also like to thank my colleagues at NHGRI and the little picture shown on the right. Elise Feingold and Peter Good launched the ENCODE project, and Elise continues to be the scientific manager for the project. More recently, Dan Gilchrist, Dan Gilchrist joined our team from NIEHS, and we're happy to have him on board, too. So I'll stop there and take any questions that anybody might have. Please use the microphones. Anybody know? Is it? Ah, yes. It activates. Are there any questions from the audience? I would make a, a comment. such as myself, um, I would like to know when you have these freely available um, uh, programs, how can we get information as novices? Because you go in and of course this is a huge uh, undertaking and could we get help? Can you get help at workshops or other, um, other ways of, of learning how to use these tools? Because thanks, they thanks. are complex. Yeah, that, that's a great question. And as, as we've developed the resource, it's becoming more and more apparent to us in Code Project, also lots of other resource projects, that this is an unmet need. We need to do more here. Um, and Code uh, has done presentations at some major meetings, for instance, this year, last year, at American Society for Human Genetics, Genomics, uh, at Biology of Genomes as well. In June and July of this year, Encode is going to have a users meeting. And the goal of that is to have people that are using or are interested in using ENCODE data to attend and hear about how ENCODE can be applied or how it's being applied by their colleagues, also ideas from ENCODE. And we have outreach efforts such as this. Um, if I might go back a slide, two slides. We do have some tutorials on both the NHGRI website, um, that's the fourth, third bullet down, and also at the ENCODE portal, depending on the topic one is interested in. These may or may not be sufficient for what you're looking for. Um, and we do do other outreach efforts, including being here today. And if you have a colleague, either a colleague close by in space or close by in cyberspace, that's always a helpful thing because while these things are public, shared, and we try and make them as obvious as possible, everyone has a different background and different application we never know for sure how to make it simple, obvious, and accessible. That, that was wonderful. So my question is in regards to some of the newer biology coming out, even at some of those meetings that you referenced, uh, and that is three, the 3D architecture and shape of the genome. Uh, clearly, this has got some tremendous potential in how we annotate regulatory regions and connect them to genes. And I'm wondering if there are already resources in place or plans to integrate this type of information with a lot of the 3D data that's coming out. Yeah, thanks. That's, that's a great question. And um, first, I'd point out that the New York, that the NIH has a common fund project, 4D nucleome. Some of the applications are in for that. Some of the RFAs are still open to investigate nuclear architecture and how it changes with time. And Code has done a little bit of science in this space, a little bit of data collection. We have some 5C assays that an, at, an, annotate portions of the genome rather than being truly genome-wide in a limited number of cell types. We also have some Chia PET data, which looks at DNA-DNA interaction, again, long range, but protein-linked. And these data are available from the portal, and they can be visualized. But we haven't gone full force in having a mapping effort there to date. And I, I, I agree with what I think you're suggesting, that one of the great applications for this kind of data is it's another way to, a principled way to say which regulatory elements may be working with which genes. What I didn't go through in the example I showed you with the JAK uh, non-receptor tyrosine kinase is that on the bottom of that was confirmatory and code chia pet data, 
suggesting that those two pieces of DNA interact. And just like binding doesn't prove function, interaction of DNA doesn't prove interaction, but boy, if I had to choose among the infinitely many hypotheses or start with that very short list, I know what I would be doing in my research program. I would take advantage of 3D interaction data wherever they exist. <laughs>